Okay, could we get started? This is huge, as they say. Um, I'm, nobody is here to introduce me, so this is, I am what I am. Um, <laughs> so the question that I want to talk about uh, is, if Citizens United isn't the problem, what's the solution? Of course, a lot of you think Citizens United is the problem, but I'm going to try to explain why I think that may be an oversimplification. I'll talk maybe for half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. I'll try not to, you know, hog the space in the room. And I'm sorry that there isn't enough space for everybody to sit down, but I hope you all got something to eat. Um, and then after I'm done, there's somebody with a microphone, and if I forget at that point to say that you should make sure that you have a microphone when you speak because this is being, uh, this is being videotaped, um, let me say that in advance. Well, it's an understatement, really, to say that the American people are disgusted with the current state of campaign finance. Uh, in his talk here a month ago, which some of you may have heard, the former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, Trevor Potter, described a recent Bloomberg poll that surprised even him in the breadth of the national consensus on the need to overturn Citizens United in order to rein in the outside influence and the enormously disproportionate influence of money and corporate power in our politics. An overwhelming majority, something like 80% of the respondents, reflexively blame that Supreme Court decision in Citizens United for that outsized influence. But as I explained or tried to explain in an article that I published in Constitutional Commentary this summer, that's a dangerous oversimplification. The slogan, overturn Citizens United, uh, has been too easily repeated and nearly impossible for reformers to resist. As a slogan, it has obscured the deeper and broader sources of the real threat to democratic and republican values with a small d and a small r that all three branches of the federal government have done too little to combat and too much to exacerbate. The executive and legislative branches have jointly failed to enact effective disclosure rules or even to enforce the limited disclosure rules that are in place. That's a failure that the court should have anticipated but didn't in Citizens United, where the court naively acted as though merely describing disclosure as the right remedy and saying that it would be upheld would somehow make it happen. But of course, it hasn't happened with any of the uh, dark money that is spent backing individual candidates, especially when it is funneled through undisclosed contributions to so-called super PACs and other nonprofit organizations with pleasant sounding names like Americans for a Better Tomorrow, names that tell you obviously nothing about who fills their bank accounts or what agenda they are pushing. If we care about curing our body politic, we've got to be smart in analyzing what ails it and realistic about what remedies are needed. Now, when nearly eight out of 10 Americans want Citizens United to be overturned by a constitutional amendment if necessary, it's not an exercise in political courage to make undoing Citizens United part of one's presidential platform. But what I want to do is offer two reasons why this Citizens United-centric narrative threatens to lead well-meaning reformers and populist activists to a dead end, increasing political cynicism and alienation among those who would put all of their bets on this particular horse. First of all, although it has generated more public opposition than any other case in recent memory, 
Citizens United is not the indefensible decision on its facts that its critics often claim, and I'll try to explain that shortly. And second, if we can look beyond the exaggerated and sometimes empty rhetoric of those who blame most of our political ills on Citizens United, we may well conclude that the way we fund campaigns in this country is actually less central to our political problems than it is made out to be. So let me start with my first point, that Citizens United isn't the unmitigated disaster that its critics often assert. Now, I do disagree, for reasons I'll explain, with the needlessly broad sweep of the court's reasoning in Citizens United. It's reasoning that I think is naive and foolishly formalistic in relying on the phony independence of electioneering organizations from the candidates that they support. And it's myopic in treating both the real and the apparent influence of money over the attention and agenda of candidates as though that was no threat to democracy and to citizen equality. It is a threat. At the same time, I think the court's five to four majority reached the right result when it vindicated the First Amendment rights of the nonprofit corporation named Citizens United to produce an electioneering video like Hillary the movie which was a video strongly slanted against Hillary Clinton. And to make that video available to paying viewers shortly before the Democratic Party's 2008 presidential primary. In my view, those rights of free speech and press belonged not just to the nonprofit entity that made and distributed the anti-Hillary video, they belonged also to those who watched the video, regardless of its source. And those rights deserve every bit as much protection under the First Amendment as they would have received if the video had been a hard copy book or an online magazine. In defending the application of federal campaign finance regulations to Hillary the movie, the Obama administration awkwardly found itself having to defend something that was pretty hard to distinguish from book burning. Now, most critics of Citizens United don't grapple with those facts. There is a lot to criticize in the majority's analysis, but the two simple bumper sticker slogans that critics levy against the decision, money isn't speech, corporations aren't people, do, I think, miss the target. Those two slogans point to a pair of constitutional fixes that would actually cause more problems than they would cure. The first fix on the anti-Citizens United agenda is to decouple the right to speak from the right to spend money to make your voice heard. The second is to make the sacrifice of free speech rights the price of organizing in a corporate or union form. Last year, retired Justice Stevens embraced the first fix by repeatedly uttering the refrain that money isn't speech. But as Justice Stevens acknowledged in his less headline-making remarks, the fact that spending money to publicize speech is fully protected by the First Amendment was settled decades ago in a series of Supreme Court decisions that, of course, treat spending bans or caps involving speech as abridgments of the freedom to speak. And it's really hard to see how it could have been otherwise. Expending resources is necessary to bring speech to the public. A newspaper like the New York Times or a corporation like the Sierra Club obviously can't operate without spending money on ink and paper and writers and editors and distribution and legal fees. So money is speech is sort of misdirected. So too, the proposition that corporations are people in the sense that the Constitution protects persons even if they take a corporate form 
along with partnerships and unions and other associations, is nothing new. The Supreme Court has long recognized that for-profit business organizations, as well as other entities that facilitate association, like nonprofits and advocacy groups, enjoy at least some constitutional protections. And depriving those associations of their rights, including First Amendment rights, abridges the rights of those who form and constitute them and unconstitutionally conditions the privilege of forming such associations on the sacrifice of those same rights. Treating the corporate or other identity of the entities that produce and distribute speech as the basis for giving government unfettered power to silence or limit the speech those entities produce and distribute would be no different whether the result is brought about by judicial revision of existing First Amendment doctrine or by amending the First Amendment itself. It would be a deep, deeply pro problematic step. It's one thing to use the law to require corporations, unions, or other collective bodies to answer to their owners or their members or their other stakeholders before spending those stakeholders' resources on election-related speech, as my colleague John Coates has sensibly proposed. That kind of change in the law of corporate governance and institutional responsibility is one that I would strongly favor. And it's one that wouldn't raise any constitutional problems in the current court. But it's another thing altogether to use the law to gag or muffle or stifle the speech itself, even when it's fully authorized in advance by the relevant stakeholders, on the ground that government has determined that such speech would exert too much influence, either on its intended audience of listeners and viewers, or on those candidates who would likely benefit from that influence. Using the law that way puts government in the dangerous position of controlling the mix of ideas and information that reach the electorate. And besides, there's something sort of perversely illogical about complaining that too many political office holders owe their jobs to corporate and personal concentrations of wealth of those who supported them, and then turning right around and giving those very policy holders and office holders kind of blank check to make whatever rules they want, perhaps incumbent protection rules that are ostensibly in the public interest. First Amendment doctrine has taught judges to review potentially self-serving exercises of power over speech with suspicion and care. Simple common sense, and I'd be reluctant to see courts abandon it. When it comes to rights that individuals enjoy in the campaign finance context, the court's jurisprudence was set on its current course, not a few years ago in Citizens United, but in 1976 in Buckley against Vallejo, which, as you know, struck down restrictions on independent political expenditures by individuals and certain groups while upholding restrictions on their direct contributions. Now, if you accept the validity of Buckley as it applies to individuals, it's pretty hard to explain why exactly the same restrictions would have to be upheld rather than struck down when placed on corporations and unions. It would have been a tough case to make despite some supportive precedent, especially if you consider the freedom of press clause along with the freedom of speech clause. If you try to distinguish news corporations or media corporations from others and say, well, these limits will not apply to the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Harvard Crimson or Playboy magazine, it's pretty hard to maintain that kind of line without giving the government too broad a power to muzzle dissident or off the grid gatherers and disseminators of information and opinion. Anyway, even if you could 
limit the corporations are different critique to some particular class of business or charitable groups that are not organized for expressly journalistic or political purposes, that would kind of miss the problem. Because it's neither for-profit corporations like General Electric or non-profits like Amnesty International that are doing most of the political donating or spending on electioneering ads. There are inherent constraints on them because they don't want to piss anybody off. I mean, business corporations have customers across the political spectrum whom they don't want to alienate. Nonprofit corporations organized around particular substantive causes like human rights or the environment get contributions from members of both political parties and people with no partisan affiliation whom they also don't want to alienate. Actually, the bulk of election-related uh, expenditures comes from wealthy individuals who filter their spending on favored candidates, typically through nonprofit entities, whether super PACs or 501c4s, that have no legal obligation to disclose the identities of their donors, even though they typically raise money on behalf of particular individuals, even when existing law supposedly forbids such single individual fundraising by nonprofits. Insofar as the critics of Citizens United rightly worry about the rise of super PACs funded by ultra wealthy donors, they should point not to the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United as the true culprit, but rather to the DC Circuit's subsequent decision in a less well known case called SpeechNow.org org versus FEC. With aggregate spending by such outside groups totaling over a billion dollars in the 2012 election cycle and set to be potentially many times that in the current cycle, a successful challenge to speech now could curb the outsize influence of super PACs. And that would be a huge step forward for those who are troubled by the current role of money in political campaigns. Now let me explain why I think such a challenge could and should succeed even in the Citizens United era. In Buckley, the Supreme Court established a clear distinction. It's a distinction that people on the right and left sometimes find troublesome, but there it is in the law between independent expenditures and campaign contributions. The court allowed limits on contributions, but struck down limits on expenditures. The theory was that if you limit the size of direct campaign contributions, you don't significantly diminish the message that is sent to the public. Just knowing that you've contributed to a candidate sends the signal that you like where that candidate stands, what that candidate would do. And the court's theory was it's the same signal whether you contribute 25 bucks or 25 million bucks. 25 million shows you've got a lot deeper pockets, but it doesn't show that your feelings are any different. On the other hand, the court said in Buckley, limiting the size of contributions could significantly offset the appearance of corruption. And it held that Congress has a compelling interest in stemming that appearance to preserve faith in the democratic system. At the same time, the court said that this anti-corruption interest isn't sufficient to limit independent expenditures by individuals, expenditures whose supposed independence of any candidate's campaign at least mitigates, if not totally negating, the whiff of a quid pro quo between candidate and donor. And so the court determined that limiting expenditures would muffle the messages that spenders could otherwise communicate. Unlike a contribution, if you spend 10 million bucks instead of 10 bucks, you can reach a lot more people. Now in Citizens United, all the court did was to extend that logic to independent expenditures by corporations and unions. And all it really held was that the anti-corruption interest was not sufficient 
to justify caps on independent spending, regardless of whether the big spender is a group or an individual. And on that relatively narrow point, I think the court was right as long as Buckley remains the law. But the court didn't stop there. Instead, there was this weird, pure dictum. Here's what the court said. Independent expenditures do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption at all. Really? I mean, nobody really believes that. That unsupported assertion suggests not only that the government's regulatory interest with respect to such expenditures wasn't sufficient to justify regulation, which is all the court held in Buckley and all the court held in Citizens United elsewhere. It actually goes further than necessary, and it claims that the regulatory interest is entirely non-existent. That was gratuitous. Now, in speech now, the D.C. Circuit seized on that wholly gratuitous and ill-considered dictum to breach the long-standing distinction between expenditures and contributions. And here's what it said, quote, in light of the court's holding as a matter of law that independent expenditures do not corrupt or create the appearance of quid pro quo corruption, contributions to groups that make only independent expenditures also cannot corrupt or create the appearance of corruption. So QED, but QE non-D. <laughs> Professor Albert Alshuler convincingly explained in an important article published this year in the Florida Law Review why the DC Circuit's decision in speech now rests on incredibly shaky ground. Rather than considering whether contributions to super PACs can reasonably be treated differently from limits on contributions to official campaigns of the kind that Buckley upheld, which they almost certainly cannot, the DC Circuit focused only on the expenditure-like aspects of super PAC contributions to shoehorn them into the Citizens United dictum, which the DC Circuit wrongly called a holding. Now, the DC Circuit's assessment of the similarities between expenditures and contributions in speech now, apart from being unwarranted in the first place, has been belied by the political and practical realities that have demonstrably undermined efforts to prevent coordination between super PACs and the politicians they support. You notice that these politicians talk about my super PAC. I mean, what could be clearer? They're, 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 you know, they have rooms next door. They're run by the same people. It's not just a revolving door. It's an open door. In the five years since speech now, it's become clear that contributions to super PACs pose exactly the same dangers as direct contributions to the candidates themselves. Among those dangers is the development of dependence by political office holders on their donors rather than on voters, of differential access by those donors to those whom their contributions help, albeit only through a super PAC, and of the resulting appearance of corruption, even in the stingily narrow sense in which the Citizens United Court used that term. The DC Circuit's utterly implausible interpretation of the Citizens United dictum that was embodied in speech now is further undermined by its tension with the Supreme Court's opinion in Caperton v. Massey Cole, decided only a year before Citizens United. In that case, Justice Kennedy sided with the four Citizens United dissenters in finding that there is an unacceptable appearance of corruption where an individual makes enormous contributions to an independent corporation supporting the re-election of a state court judge. In just last term, Chief Justice Roberts in Williams U. Lee versus Florida Bar sided with the Citizens United dissenters in rejecting a First Amendment challenge to a state law prohibiting state judges from soliciting contributions to their election or re-election campaigns. Now, it's true that both Caperton and Williams-Yu Lee involved judges, 
But as Justice Scalia wrote in his williams Lee dissent, the First Amendment is not abridged for the benefit of the brotherhood of the robe. In light of the paper-thin doctrinal framework on which the DC Circuit's decision in speech now is built, and the holes in Citizens United's armor that the court poked in the pair of cases involving judicial elections, I think reformers should train their sights on speech now, which is just an intermediate court decision that the Supreme Court could still overturn without abandoning any of its own precedents. One or more of the justices in the Citizens United majority, Kennedy perhaps, the Chief Justice perhaps, could well be persuaded that speech now did not follow logically from Citizens United and that the DC Circuit's unjustified extrapolation from Citizens United has done genuine harm both to democracy and to the court's institutional capital harm that could be pared back substantially without unsettling the First Amendment justifications for the court's Citizens United decision. Now, on the 16th of this month, there's going to be a symposium held in this building um, in which various people, Al Alshuler and I and some others, will take part, talking in greater detail about a political strategy to gin up litigation that would get rid of speechnow.org. And I think that would make a huge dent in the current problem. But even if the critics were right to trace the problem not to Speech Now but to Citizens United, I think they've made a big mistake by singling out campaign finance as the big problem that has to be resolved before moving on to more substantive, ambitious goals. You've heard people say, if we don't solve that problem, we might as well not work on guns, on environment, on health, on anything else, because it'll all come out badly, which doesn't really explain how we managed to enact any reforms in any of these areas. Some critics of Citizens United point to studies showing that American policymakers tend to enact the preferences of the affluent as evidence that campaign contributions create a form of dependence that distorts and corrupts the political process by making policymakers more responsive to the rich than to the rest of us. Yet that popular thesis may get the chain of causation absolutely backwards. As one of my current 3L students, Liz Reese, has suggested in a really insightful forthcoming paper, if the rich are so good at using their money to get politicians to support their favorite causes. Maybe they're also good at using their money to persuade the rest of us to support those causes. Certainly not because the rest of us become dependent on them as donors and spenders. When politicians end up supporting the very policies that the broader electorate, even perhaps against its enlightened self-interest, has been convinced to support. It's pretty hard to view that as distortion or corruption without, as Liz Reese points out, rejecting the premises of democracy as a form of government. In fact, as authors of empirical studies suggesting that the rich may possess outsized influence on politics are often quick to point out, campaign contributions are just a small part of the story. Powerful groups find lots of ways to exert their power. It's true across political systems with very different electoral institutions. If the exceptionally libertarian campaign finance law of the United States is what produces policies that favor the wealthy, that hurt the middle class, that hurt the poor, why have countries like the UK and Germany, both of which have robust public funding of elections and strict regulation of private political expenditures and shorter campaigns, also seen parties with platforms of tax cuts and deregulation of banks and financial institutions and the internet take power in recent decades. Clearly, there are more systemic forces at work. 
you know, maybe it's just that voters in some Western democracies have been persuaded to like these small government platforms, whether by the propaganda paid for by the rich or for other reasons altogether. Elite dominance of politics isn't a problem unique to wealthy modern democracies either. Throughout human history, both earned and unearned advantages have enabled some individuals to exert influence out of proportion to their numbers in shaping the political beliefs of their fellow citizens, as well as the policies that public officials enact. I have in mind everything from natural talents to happenstance connections with people occupying positions of official power to social status and other class privileges that accidents of birth make differentially available. Now, it is possible to formulate enforceable constitutional constraints to prevent particular identified factors like race or gender or age or ability to afford an access fee from serving to exclude parts of the population altogether from basic processes like casting a vote or going to court. That's what our 15th and 19th and 24th and 26th amendments do. But attempting to prevent justly or unjustly accumulated wealth from unduly amplifying the clout that some people are able to exercise as though the ideal of one person, one vote, one person, one sandwich, one person, one cookie uh, could be translated into an enforceable rule of one person, one unit of influence. That's almost certainly an illusory goal, too ill-defined to be defended and too ambitious to be achieved. And that remains true even if our Constitution permits government, as I believe it does, to limit the amount any individual can contribute to a candidate or to a candidate's super PAC. The puzzle of how to treat both campaign spending and its too often overlooked first cousin lobbying expenditures is really just a small part of a broader, deeply distressing story, a story that's really inseparable from the vicious circle of unjust inequalities in the economic sphere leading to unjust inequalities in the political sphere, leading right back to the replication of economic inequalities. But that shouldn't lead you to despair. It isn't to say that progressive change is impossible. Our history demonstrates that groups of dedicated activists are capable of changing the political consensus and enacting ambitious reforms, whether they have to do with health or with sexual orientation or with any number of things, even in the face of elite and heavily funded opposition. We've got to remember that the problem of disproportionate elite power is not specific to our era, and today's reformers should not let the red herrings of Citizens United and money in politics convince them that no progress is possible unless those roadblocks are first removed. It's a very convenient excuse for a paralyzed political process. Oh, we haven't solved the financial problem and therefore don't blame us for doing nothing. In addition to the problem of elite dominance of the political agenda, another intrinsic feature of democratic politics contributes to what many of us see as systemic political dysfunction. It's the fact that small, highly motivated groups are often able to exert their political will against the more diffuse preferences of large majorities, something that happens without recourse to the supposedly corrupting and dependence-generating influence of campaign contributions. Take, for example, the gun lobby's construction of obstruction of gun safety legislation designed to keep weapons whose purpose is to kill human beings out of the hands of those whom nearly everybody agrees shouldn't be allowed to possess them notwithstanding the Second Amendment. After decades of increasingly frequent mass shootings and the less visible but no less lethal drumbeat of daily death on our city streets, large majorities of the American people support 
much stricter limits on gun purchases and bullet purchases. But groups like the NRA have successfully blocked significant reforms, always invoking fears of the slippery slope. It is not because the NRA or gun and ammo manufacturers are for the most part major campaign contribu contributors. It's principally because the most enthusiastic believers in a virtually absolute constitutional right to own and carry guns are intensely motivated. They make unfettered access to guns and bullets the issue on which they vote, regardless of where political incumbents or aspirants stand on other issues of interest to those same voters. Why else do you suppose that Bernie Sanders voted against the Brady Bill five times? It surely was not because he was dependent on the gun lob lobby for campaign contributions or expenditures. This deadly dynamic has persisted despite the intervention of billionaire Mike Bloomberg, who has spent huge sums of his own money trying to unseat and discredit politicians who vote against gun control. That's just one example of many in which Citizens United is not to blame and money is not the culprit. Here's a second example. It's pretty easy for intensely interested parties to obstruct would-be reforms in a deadlocked Congress riven by partisan polarization. That's a phenomenon traceable in part to demographic changes, but significantly to political gerrymandering that the Supreme Court has unfortunately deemed itself powerless to review and remedy. And it's due in part to the court's gutting of voting rights laws in justly infamous decisions like Shelby County. The polarized line drawing that renders many congressional districts safe from challenge leads to a huge misalignment of interests between representatives who only need to satisfy the one-party politics that controls in their home districts and the larger national interests that we count on them to protect. Now, by pointing to these more systemic, less tractable problems with our political system, I don't mean to suggest that we have no recourse, that we cannot strive to build a democracy that deserves the name. We shouldn't imagine that we can completely fix the problems of disproportionate elite influence or eliminate the power of highly mobilized minorities, power that sometimes works in a progressive direction as well, or that we can eliminate all gerrymandering or that we can solve any of the other systemic problems completely, but we can improve them. Now, from my explanation of why I don't see Citizens United as the culprit that many imagine it to be, you won't be surprised to learn that I'm not pushing the idea of a constitutional amendment to overturn it, assuming one could get such an amendment passed, which one couldn't. <laughs> As I've shown, even if Citizens United remains the law, we're not doomed to live with speech now as settled law. And even if we were, our hands wouldn't be completely tied when it comes to regulating fin campaign finance. We really could push for additional disclosure requirements. We could push to basically shame the FEC into more aggressively policing the law that is now on the books, designed to prevent coordination between super PACs and campaigns. There's also the possibility of public financing of campaigns, but I want to say a few words to suggest why that possibility is not the end all and be all that some think. You know, a lot of academics suggest ambitious national voucher systems in which each citizen gets a few bucks uh, to donate to a campaign of the citizen's choice. Well, that may make a difference in really low-profile state and local races where private contributions tend to be relatively tiny. But on the national stage, the huge checks that super PACs can write will remain attractive no matter how many hundred-dollar citizen vouchers are redeemed. And the Supreme Court has unfortunately ruled, and I don't see any way around this one, that attempts to level the playing field by matching private spending for one candidate with public spending for the other, run afoul of the First Amendment. So in high-stakes races, big stashes of private money will continue to talk. 
Another, maybe more promising academic proposal has come from professors Heather Gerken and Joseph Fishkin. They've suggested that restrictions on fundraising and spending by the political parties be lifted so the parties can operate as institutional counterweights to the super PACs. Their reason for favoring such counterweights is pretty simple. Political parties are somewhat more accountable than shadowy super PACs. They have brands and reputations to uphold with voters. They're staffed in large part by grassroots activists who are motivated more by ideals than by self-interest. And for similar reasons, Professor Alshuler has proposed lifting the remaining limits on contributions to candidates and individual campaigns. Well, I see the logic of all that, but I worry that the processes by which those limits might be lifted would themselves produce dangerous unintended consequences. If Congress begins the process of removing contribution limits, that could unleash unpredictable political forces bolstered by the self-interest of incumbent politicians that could generate even more unhealthy changes to the campaign finance system. If the judiciary were to strike down limits on campaign contributions under the First Amendment, that would create a scary risk that the court, with its institutional inclination to push decisions to their logical extremes, would deliver a holding, or at least a strong dictum, endangering contribution limits generally, including limits on super PACs and 501c4s. And even if we avoided all the risks posed by the process of stripping away a campaign contribution limits, there's good reason to doubt that money really would begin to flow to more responsible actors. As long as Congress fails to enact effective disclosure requirements on the sources of independent expenditures, as the court naively imagined it would in Citizens United, wealthy donors will have an incentive to funnel their contributions through opaque super PACs rather than through the more relatively open parties and campaigns. The very thing that makes super PACs dangerous from a regulatory perspective, their lack of transparency and accountability, is just what makes them attractive to so many donors. But thankfully, we don't have to confine ourselves within the somewhat cramped campaign finance frame. There are a number of interventions that we can make to mitigate the outsized influence for example, of powerful lobbying groups, which arguably have a more direct impact on public policy than campaign contributions. Direct lobbying of lawmakers and regulators by the hired guns of business and industry is an accepted feature of the Washington landscape. It's so plainly protected by the First Amendment and by the right to petition the government that just about any imaginable version of the First Amendment would leave that largely unregulated. It's really odd that reformers who focus on how people get elected pay so little attention to the far more consequential issue of how they govern once they are elected. The huge influence of K Street, the home of the army of lobbyists who are steeped in the minutiae of regulated businesses, and who supply their clients and regulators alike with the knowledge they need to craft detailed legal rules and to poke holes in legislative and administrative proposals. That knowledge needs to be countered. There's a real hazard in outsourcing research to self-interested parties like industry lobbyists. A significantly beefed up, nonpartisan congressional research department might help to mitigate the undue influence of lobbyists and thereby improve the quality of our public policy. And Congress could also beef up the laughably weak current requirements for the re registration of lobbyists and the disclosure of lobbying activities. We should also consider prohibitions on the infamous revolving door between the public and private sectors. It's been revolving even faster lately in the financial industry with high-level bankers taking off for Washington to regulate the very industries they once led and then cashing in on Wall Street again when their term in office is up. 
former colleague of mine and teacher of at least some of yours, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, has, I think, sensibly proposed banning private sector bonuses to employees leaving government service to enter the business and financial worlds. Finally, bottlenecks and sources of corruption in legislative and regulatory processes can be addressed, at least at the state and local level, by carefully deployed resort to direct democracy. California's energetic Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom is using California's ballot initiative process to push strict regulation of ammunition sales in California to circumvent the fear of single-issue pro-gun voters on the part of state lawmakers. And the U.S. Supreme Court just this summer upheld by a five to four vote a popular referendum that amended Arizona's state constitution to delegate, to delegate the task of drawing legislative districts to an independent commission. So there are all kinds of things that we can do without relying too heavily on the simplistic slogan that corporations are not people and that money is not speech. And I'm afraid I haven't left more than about 15 minutes for Q&A, but at least I've left some time. And if you have questions, please make sure that somebody brings you the mic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. So, questions? Thanks. Um, so I, I was with you throughout much of your talk about the need to focus more attention on Speech Now as opposed to Citizens United and so on and so forth. But one area where I have to be honest, where you totally lost me, was when you started saying that money or campaign financing system and the way it exists right now does not create a culture of mutual dependence whereby concentrated and wealthy interests are able to influence uh, legislators and regulators to pass things that are in their favor. And that's why we get this um, outcome where you know, those interests are, are served more by legislation and regulation than people without those sorts of resources. Anybody who's worked with legislators by the way, or, I, yeah, I'm ahead. sorry, but that's not my view. Okay. I do think there's a terrible culture of dependence, but I think it has many causes. And I don't think Citizens United is at the heart of it. Sure. I think okay. the revolving door in lobbying is part of it. All these things are part of it. I, I don't mean to suggest any degree of sympathy with the naive view that these people don't get something for the dollars that they right. contribute either to candidates or to super PACs. They do. So I, I don't want you to proceed okay. on the premise that, I, that you and I disagree about that. Okay. Well, then that, that's important because it wasn't quite clear based on okay. your comparison to international systems and how money can still influence in those systems where there are limits on spending. And, yeah, and that's just to put it in perspective. Okay. To say that's not the only source of the problem. Got it. All right. Well, then my, my question is probably moot then. But thanks. Okay. <laughs> other, other questions? I don't, I don't mean to shut everything down as moot, but that particular one, since we agree, I might as well take advantage of the fact that we agree. Uh, Professor Tribe, you spoke a lot about this closure as a possible remedy to some of the corrupting effects you spoke about. My personal view is that this closure doesn't do much because, um, you know, the general um, electorate doesn't have the energy or the expertise to, you know, really parse out who's funding what. So I, I just wanted to ask for more clarification on what role you think this closure would have in, you know, upholding democracy. I think it would help. That's all. I, th I think that people, the very people who you know, like lurking in the shadows and not disclosing who they are or whom they're supporting uh, would be outed by disclosure. But I don't think it would solve everything. That's why I'm strongly in favor of capping the massive expenditures of super PACs. And contrary to what the DC Circuit believed, I do not think that the Supreme Court and Citizens United put a constitutional obstacle in the path to doing that. Now, I wouldn't bet my life, or even you know, half of the life that's, <laughs> that remains, uh, on, on, on being able to overturn speech now and prevail in the Supreme Court. But it sure as hell is worth the effort. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? <clears throat> 
Yes. Thea? See, I know some of your names because you've been in my classes. Others, I'm afraid I don't. Yeah, your voice will carry. <laughs> so my question is just about whether or not you think that if the court had recognized a stronger countervailing right, right, besides just having the speech implication, it seems like corruption is really the only thing they're saying could actually be an effective balance on the other side. And I think that goes along with what you're saying, that our court has not recognized an affirmative right to vote. Our court has really not recognized a very strong tacit postulate or anything like that that says safeguarding the democratic process is something that should really be paramount. And so it's a little bit of a counterfactual, I guess, but if the court had recognized a stronger right on the other side, do you think that could potentially have changed the outcome of Citizens United or would perhaps change the outcome in subsequent cases? Well, it would certainly, I think, if the court had said not just that there's an interest in avoiding corruption and its appearance and dependence on funders, but that that dependence violates a kind of collective right to self-government. That certainly would have been an important, much more important counterweight than merely an interest. Um, and it, I think, would have made it much harder for something like citizens, like speech now to come out the way it did. But in fact, it's not entirely a counterfactual. If you think about it, the Supreme Court has said in a number of cases, in odd places you might not think to look, like Obergefell dealing with same-sex marriage, it is said that one of the reasons for allowing people to govern themselves uh, is to protect a right on the part of the people to have an evolving understanding of the Constitution. Like Kennedy has said in a lot of the states' rights cases, that one of the reasons that we protect states' rights is to, present, to protect an affirmative right to accountable self-government. Theory, which may or may not be valid in itself, is that if we mix up state and federal roles so people don't know whom to blame when something goes wrong and the potholes don't get filled or some federal program is not satisfied, um, if we mix up those roles, then self-government doesn't work. And self-government is not simply a, a, a nice interest. It's at the root of the rights that the Constitution protects. Now, it might well be that a Constitution that, like ours, nowhere affirmatively protects a right to vote doesn't go as far as it should. I mean, all we have is a series of negatives. You can't deny the vote on grounds of race, on grounds of sex, on grounds of age when somebody reaches 18, on grounds of failure to pay a poll tax. But nowhere do we actually say there's a right to vote except in the 17th Amendment, which indirectly does that by saying that the Senate is to be elected by the people rather than by state legislatures. If we really em embodied in the Constitution a full-throated right to vote, I think we would make real progress toward taking things that are now just counterweights and making them rights on the other side. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering maybe if you could just clarify your point as to why um, some politicians might support uh, unpopular ideas. You were mentioning a 3 L's um, paper, and it seems to me um, uh, that it might depend on the specific issue. So. Um, uh, for example, the minimum wage would seem to be an issue where you might say that uh, you've seen the minimum wage be passed in lots of red states, so maybe that is a donor issue because uh, donors tend to be employers and it's a very popular position even among conservatives, whereas an issue, um, you know, like same-sex marriage, let's say, is more popular with the conservative base, so it makes sense maybe that's not a donor issue. Um, I guess maybe I just... No, I think it's, it's a good question. I don't mean to suggest that that's a complete explanation from everything. But would, would, would Liz, do you want to say a few words about where, I, I don't mean to embarrass you, but <laughs> about why you think that's an important dimension? So, um, I mean, I'm taking advantage <laughs> of her happening to be here. But. So I, I think the point that I'm, I'm trying to make in, in that paper that I'm working on is that a lot of the debate about um, sort of buying, elites sort of buying preferences essentially seems to assume 
more so that what's happening is that people are, is that um, wealthy donors are directly influencing the politicians after they're elected or that the um, primary dependence is on um, needing those donations in the process of being elected. But I think that part of the piece that's missing there is that um, I think, you know, even in examples like the minimum wage, I think that very wealthy donors are very good at using persuasive rhetoric and also the way that they spend their money to convince a lot of the electorate that that's just bad for the economy and that people are still sort of voting for that. Um, I mean, if you, if there's yeah. lots of people who vote against their own self-interest in all sorts of ways. And it may well be, I mean, certainly not the case as a complete explanation of everything, but it may well be that a lot of people get persuaded by, despite the econometric evidence to the contrary, that if you raise the minimum wage, what you're going to do is um, create more unemployment or make it harder for teenagers to get jobs and make it harder for other, even more disadvantaged groups to be employed. That may not be true, mm -hmm. but the very same people who manage to use their economic clout to get politicians to go with them may be able successfully to get lots of the electorate to buy lots of phony arguments. That's, that's the idea. And again, I, it's not a suggestion that that explains everything. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to be offering some kind of totalistic uh, theory, only that things are, as often, more complicated than they seem. And that this idea of putting all your eggs in the Citizens United basket, I mean, I think those eggs were broken long ago. Yes, Rachel? I was wondering if you could just say, like, assuming that Buckley and Citizens United had never been decided, um, like, what you would think would be the best case for treating a corporation, all corporations as um, in the same position as individuals with regards to freedom of speech. And just what I'm particularly thinking about is those sort of big companies like Coca-Cola or Microsoft or whatever who make large political expenditures um, where the owners of the company have very little control over what the company does and whether there's kind of a... Um, we had a very interesting lecture last week on this, on this subject, whether there's a kind of a forced speech concern there because the board of directors really has ultimate control over the company's political views and the ultimate owners have no control over that, really. Right, no, that, that's why I didn't attend, I wanted to, but I didn't go to Jim Coates' talk the other day, but did some of you hear Professor Coates? I mean, what I understand his views to be, um, I understand his views to be that corporations, because of the way in which the people who manage them are essentially using other people's money, uh, as a result of the corporate laws, they have the capacity to speak that individuals don't typically have. I mean, most of us can't simply take other people's money and use it to amplify our voices. That is a rationale for treating corporations differently from people, but differently in terms of the relationship between those who decide what the corporations will say and those who have an ownership stake in them through their position as shareholders. That is, you could flip the assumption. You could, you, you could say that corporations whose primary business is making money for shareholders need to get affirmative shareholder consent before they can do and say things that support particular candidates or oppose particular candidates. They might not be able to get that consent. Now, I suggest that the problem is not as big as it might otherwise be because lots of corporations have an interest in not alienating the people that they might alienate by being pro-Bernie Sanders or anti-Hillary Clinton or, uh, or pro-Donald you know, Trump or whatever. Um, but that only means, again, to put the problem in perspective. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what do we do with the argument that for like every George Soros of the world, there's a Sheldon ounce, and that all this money is sloshing around? Yes, it's sloshing around, but it's canceling each other out. You know, we've seen all the super PACs spend, but it's not well, going to use one know, Do I really believe it's canceling itself out? I mean, no, no, but like, how do, you, how do we address that? Well, in other words, if, if you are someone who sees a need for progressive reform, even if you agree with me that the need is not exactly what some people often describe it to be, 
and somebody comes back and says, oh no, everything is great. Uh, there's money sloshing around, but it cancels itself out. Look at Eric Cantor. He had a 26 to one advantage over his uh, Brat opponent. And I don't mean that as an adjective. I guess the guy's name was David Brat. Um, <laughs> and, yet he, and yet he lost, so, so not to worry. Well, it seems to me that, that there are reasons to worry, that the reasons to worry are reasons that you can elaborate empirically in terms of how much impact the money does have, uh, but it, there's no direct one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, but really, I guess, I, I think that at this school anyway, you get ample ammunition for the view that money is the problem. And I, I simply wanted to present a kind of partial antidote saying that money is a problem, but it's not the only problem. Yes, Liz? I, I'm intrigued by the proposal of trying to um, rely more on direct democracy for, to sort of circumvent mm -hmm. a lot of sort of the discrepancy between public opinion um, and preferences on certain things and what's getting voted for and passed. But I wonder if it happened too much, would you, do you think there's a chance that it would be challenged under the guarantee clause if a s state started relying on that too much? Right. Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, if, if you essentially dismantle representative government and turn a state over to the direct governance of the people, at some point, though so far it's been treated as a non-justiciable political question, at some point you may be violating Article 4's guarantee to every state of a Republican form of government. And I think even short of that, we know that there are occasions on which, as opposed to the somewhat deliberative process of representative bodies, the people can go wild in sort of an orgy of you know, passing amendments all across the country, banning same-sex marriage before Obergefell. Uh, so I do think that there is a danger in going too far with the initiative and the referendum. But I, I think that, again, at places like Harvard, you get lots of, lots of instruction about how dangerous democracy is. And I wanted to give a slight antidote that occasionally democracy, well, I guess Winston Churchill said it best. He said, democracy is terrible, but it's better than all the alternatives. Um, should we, I don't, is there anyone who's supposed to be controlling how long we can go? <laughs> Yeah, if people want to stay, I'm, I'm happy to, to stay, yeah. Do you think uh, if super PACs continue and continue to grow, they could weaken the duopoly that the political parties exert on our system now? And do you think they might make them less all controlling? And would that be a good thing? Well, I guess they're, they're, despite the bad rap that the political parties often get, um, they are probably more responsible and transparent than a lot of the shady alternatives. Um, but I don't think the political parties are likely to be dismantled or that the no labels movement is likely to be greatly expanded by the current regime of super PACs. Assuming that speechnow.org is not reversed and that we have a growth of existing super PACs, it seems to me they are at least as likely to end up supporting people who get chosen by the base of the Democratic Party or by the base of the um, Republican Party as they are promoting independence. Um, and I think that it would take something quite different to have either a multi-party system or a system in which a third party could finally rise to exercise significant power. And I'm really of two minds as to how good that would be. I mean, I do think that under other systems of government, parliamentary systems and systems of proportional representation, that the, a two-party framework uh, is probably a bad thing. Here, I think it has done probably more good than harm over the long run. Okay, last question. <laughs> Final question? Okay, well, thank you all, those of you who stayed.